Hi, my name's Tyrell Obrek. I'm a fifth generation rancher on the Louis Peachy Ranch. My wife and I moved here three years ago. We graze cover crops on Jones, Jones Brothers Farms. That's David and Andrew Jones, our brothers, and their uncle Terry Jones still involved with the operation. Uh, they don't have cows and we don't farm, so we thought it was a, a pretty good partnership. Jones's farm, just a little bit over 4,000 acres, uh, pretty intensive crop rotation with cereal grains, some pulse crops, as well as flax, um, different oil seeds, and they tried a cover crop here last year and we, we grazed 150 heifers on it. Uh, a different mix last year and this year, I'll, I'll provide the, the mix chart so you, you know what's in there, but what we did last fall is, is we had this solar panel here for water as well as a spring that's about a half a mile east of me. And uh, we had a lot of snow, a lot of cold weather, so the, the solar panel didn't quite keep up. I'd say the spring was our main source of water. But this is, a, this is an excellent well. Uh, this fall we're hoping for a little more normal weather, whatever that means, in Montana. But we're hoping this solar panel does a little better to keep up. Last year we just ran an electric fence. We, we let them have the whole acreage. They were here for about two months. Uh, they dug down through the snow. I thought they did they did really well. One of my favorite observations was about the middle of December. Um, we got about 20 below zero. The cows all left left this. They had a free choice to go into our pasture. They got into the coolies because it was so cold. And uh, three days later, typical of Montana, it was about 40 degrees outside, and the cows came back to a fence corner and that they were pushing the fence corner to get back into the cover crop. They really wanted to graze it. So we're, uh, we're planning on taking out a border fence anyway. So we just took the fence down and let the cows come in here until about the day before Christmas where they were still grazing down through about a foot of heavy wet snow. Um, Jones has planted it. They planted it in early June, both years, uh, about three quarter of an inch deep. And then we didn't get to it till about October last year to graze. This year is gonna be about September 10th. 150 yearlings this year, we're hoping at 180 yearlings and, and continuing to grow that. Uh, Pre-plant pre uh, preparation with, with some chemical um, and then seeding. Jones's figure about $19 an acre. Our cover crop seed the last two years has been about $23 an acre. And uh, how we pay for that is Jones's, Jones's prep the field, get everything taken care of. Uh, then we split the seed 50-50 and then we'll take half, leave half is the idea with that. Uh, last year it was kind of hard to tell on the take half, leave half. There was so much snow. We, we had a hard time and I, I think we took a little bit too much. Uh, this year, as you'll see in a month, we're gonna shrink up the pastures. You know, we're not gonna be moving the yearlings every day, but maybe every week. Hopefully they trample down some more weeds, eat, eat some more weeds. Uh, we kind of felt like they were a little bit too, too selective last year. So Jones's, Jones's main goal is they're, they're looking at a no-till continuous crop operation. Uh, they, they, they do some soil sampling every year to see exactly what the crop needs for nutrients as to not spend too much on inputs and, and kind of make the, the input side of farming as efficient as possible. So, so Andrew's done some soil sampling on this. We're hoping some of the, some of the fecal matter and the hoof activity from the animals really, really gets everything going. Uh, as well as a diverse diverse root system in the soil and you know just kind of get it back to an ecosystem where there's some diversity there's constant roots growing in the soil and we get uh, we, we get some health back and, and hopefully lower the inputs on the farming side as, as well as get more grazing for our yearlings so those that that was Jones's biggest goal was the soil health of things our biggest goal was uh, we want to run more yearlings shrink up the breeding window on those yearlings. I feel it's a better herd management um, practice. Get a shorter breeding window for, for the entire cow herd and then we're, we're really trying to push our heifer calves through the winter on as absolutely little groceries as we can. So uh, we're keeping more of them. Our conception rate is going down but, but we feel like we're selecting for fertility. So our, our conception rate on the yearlings is going down but our, our long-term longevity on the cow herd will increase. So. Um, when they come over here, we'll trail them about two and a half miles across Native Prairie. After we preg check them, the dries will, will, will go to Chinook uh, Bear Paw Livestock, be sold at auction. We keep a few dries that we've, we finish on, on grass and a little bit of hay barley that we grow. Uh, keep
keep them for ourselves, but but the the brad heifers become part of the herd, and they'll be over here in September. All right, we've got Mason Friedrich. He is my nephew from Shepherd, Montana, grazing expert and ranch manager here for the summer. So Mason, could you tell me what our goal was for grazing this cover crop? For the yearlings to graze more. And then how many acres total are we grazing? 200. And then how many, how many days ago was this seeded? 70. And then when we bring the yearlings in here to graze, how many days after seeding will that be? 100 days after seeding. Thank you, Mason. So while we're looking... You did good. So while we're looking here at the cover crop, uh, the oats are definitely the most dominant crop this year. There's some German millet, some types of vetch, uh, some radishes to break up soil compaction. Soil compaction was an issue. Uh, Joneses were maybe worried about. They thought if, if it was too wet in the fall, maybe the, the cows would trample too much and make it rough. Uh, we had all kinds of moisture last fall, all kinds of moisture this spring, so that, that turned out to, to not be an issue. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention in this video was when it comes to marketing, uh, Joneses use a forward contract with local elevators as well as just some delivery during harvest uh, depending on storage and, and how the crop year is going. Uh, Obrex, uh, that's us on Louis Petrie Ranch. We, we forward contract our steers and we sell one load of heifers in the fall right off the cow towards the end of October. Uh, we like to let our cows get good and fat again before the winter. Uh, believe it or not, winter up in north central Montana can be pretty harsh. So we keep, keep yearlings enough to keep the herd replaced and, and, and manage as I mentioned in the previous video. So that's kind of how we operate and uh, it's, it's been working pretty good. Last year, I, I think our biggest mistake was we kind of let the cows selective graze and, and we didn't quite have enough water. So this year we're going to set up an alley to that spring and, and be moving those critters more often. And I, I think we're going to like the benefit of that. So I wanted to show, I think that's a pretty good flow for a solar panel, nice clear day uh, in the middle of August up here. Those days obviously get shorter in the fall, but when we do have some sunshine, I uh, just wanted to show that it's pretty, pretty impressive how much water the sun can pump. And then when I release the float here to the left of the screen, uh, I've got a little switch there and uh, the pump turns off. Pretty simple. Uh, very, very user friendly and, and it's, it's a very reliable source of water when the sun's out. So here's the spring I mentioned in the previous video. Uh, not much to see. There's an old dam there that's since washed out, but it's probably 10 to 15 gallon a minute spring in the fall. Uh, excellent source of water. And as you t t turn the camera back west, uh, you can see along the fence line, native pasture crops from Jones's cereal grain and then just over that skyline is where the cover crop is so we're going to fence an alley from there back to here this fall and that'll be a secondary source of water assuming it gets too cold or too foggy. Okay so I wanted to show you today um, kind of our entire electric fence uh, set up or operation if you will. Um, this, this came, everything you see here came out of our scrap barrel, so we really don't have much into it, but got a U-bolt here so that these can bolt to the rack on a four-wheeler, or else I got a rod here uh, that can go down into the, the holes on the side of a Polaris Ranger, and that's how we, how we unroll all of our wire. Uh, pretty simple, set this on the rack or the box, whether you're in a four-wheeler or a Ranger, that's what we use to unroll everything. And then put on a disc, disc right here. Uh, that's absolutely necessary if you don't have a disc. I've, I've had a spool break and I can tell you that untangling a mile of electric fence is a lot longer than unrolling it. So, so make sure you have a disc and then you slide this over there once the disc is on so that this can spin freely when you're driving the four-wheeler. And then you put a put a mile roll on. I'll show you that here in a second. So pretty simple. Um, and then we usually unroll a half mile at a time. We kind of feel like if we're putting up any more than a half mile of electric fence, we, we got to really look and see if it's worth the, worth the time and effort. So uh, we buy mile spools, and then we buy buy handheld rolls from Speedrite, and then we we transfer a, a half mile onto those. 
so we can kind of use each roll to, to set off a half mile by half mile so you get down to 160 acre paddocks is kind of our goal. So, so not, nothing too fancy, but it works when, when it comes to unrolling it. So the reason we buy the mile rolls, uh, which is the, the wood spool up here. This is what a mile roll looks like. It's 280 bucks. Uh, this is why you need the disc. If you unroll this on a flat surface, these uh, washers will catch, tear out the spool. Uh, you've got more mess than what you want to deal with. So. 280 bucks for a mile versus uh, one of the quarter mile rolls individually is $100. So we initially bought a couple of those, but we decided, you know, just for the sake of saving. So once the half mile comes off the roll, we put it on this. And uh, so this, this mounts onto a, a T post out in the pasture or on the cover crop. And then the T-post will slide over this on the square tubing. And then we have a, a mounting bracket where, so it sits just like that on your square tubing. Uh, again, you know, all this came out of the scrap barrel minus the pin. So we don't have hardly anything into it. And then on this side here, you can see there's a bolt. So when it comes time to roll this up, we just get a cordless electric drill, put it on there and uh, roll up a half mile of fence pretty easy. And all of this, all of this is speed right. We do have one Gallagher roller, but the guy uh, in Turner that sells this stuff sells speed right. So other than that, uh, your cost on these about $4 a piece on your pigtails, figure about 100, 100 of those per mile. And then your wire, so you're looking at, you know, 700 bucks in material for a mile of wire and then Charger was $330. So not a whole lot of cost into it when you really start to figure out what you can get. You can add seven or eight pastures pretty easy with electric fence, you know, versus, versus a permanent setup. The last thing I wanted to show you, we, uh, when it comes, comes time to, to, to dissecting your pastures, so we'll, We'll, we'll run a hot wire across to 320 to make it a 160. And then we, we sometimes run hot wires across that 160 to make it usually 440s or maybe 280s. But what we do, uh, just just simple baling wire, wrap that around a, a, a T post. And then we use these, these plastic offsets with your conductor wire. So, if, if you're running this off a hot wire, you take this end and you hook it onto the hot wire. And then as, as you can see, it, it comes around and hooks onto this little loop. So then we take this and we put it on the end, end of the hot wire that you're using to dissect the pasture even more. So it's, it's kind of just a cheap way to make a gate. So when, when we hook this in, your, your connecting wire right here is conducting from the hot wire and then it, it conducts electricity all the way through the handle to get your, your spur lines hot. So uh, it is kind of crude, but it's, it's really cheap and we've had really good luck with it so far. That's a little trick that, that uh, our local dealer showed us. He's got quite a bit of experience with this. So other than that, um, if, I could change, if I could change anything, I would use poly wire instead of the heavy cable. Uh, the heavy cable is definitely very sturdy and whatnot, but you know, you get a, I mean, if, if you, it, it's hard for me to hold this up. If you get a half mile roll, it's pretty heavy and awkward. So that is a downfall. And then uh, finally, I guess once it's on these, these half mile rolls and we, we want to put out more wire, you know, we'll, we'll just simply tie this off on the end. I'll sit on the back of a four wheeler or the back of a Ranger. Uh, my dad or my wife will just drive and I'll just sit there and hold it and unroll it. So it, we can get a half mile fence unrolled in, in just a couple minutes and then we turn around and walk back down it. So half mile fence can be installed in a half hour or so, you know, depending on the terrain. So that's kind of it. You know, like I said, a lot of our stuff is in half mile sections and 
and uh, just getting into the electric fence thing, but we've been on it for three years now, and, and we, we really like, like the results we've been seeing. So here's uh, both of our chargers that we have. This is the first one we got. Took a 12 volt deep cycle battery. Um, worked great, never had any issues with it. Um, got your, your red hooks onto your, your electric fence. The green is the ground. So for the ground, I got these grounding rods. Uh, we usually put two of them in and then string some wire across them, put them about 10 to 15 feet apart just to get a little better ground. We haven't always done that. Uh, we've definitely got some rocky terrain, so we just pound in one. Haven't had an issue with that either. So I'm not sure if the two is necessary, but then when you uh, when you string the wire between them, you know, you simply hook your green onto the ground. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Don't have any issues with this still today. Uh, it's still, we still use it. It's just the, the deep cycle battery is pretty heavy. It's a little bit awkward to use. And uh, as always, technology is getting better. So this is our newest one. Um, it's got a gel battery back here in the box, but I mean, it's, it's very light, very, very simple uh, charger. Same, same thing with, it's got a red and a green cord in here, but it's got, it's got a spot underneath it. You can mount it on a T-post if you want. Uh, we're just gonna set it on a piece of wood right on the ground. So we're gonna give that a shot this time and, and let you know how it goes. But both of these are one jewel and uh, we've never had any more than about a mile of electric fence charged at a time. Uh, and that was a half mile T. So we had a half mile going north and south and a half mile going east and west. And uh, those wires were connected, charged with this one. We had between eight and 11 uh, kilovolts going through the charger at any time. So, I think for, for that size of pasture, this, this is plenty of heat. And this was, uh, they were about $335 for both of them. So your, your, your cost is, is the same no matter what unit you go with. So now we're gonna put up another half mile of wire to the south. This will be the wire that we continue to move as we give the cows more crop. Uh, when we bring the yearlings on here, we're gonna have 170 yearlings on about 15 acres of cover crop. So somewhere around seven to 8,000 pounds of animal per acre. Uh, it's eight or nine times more than what they see when they're out on the native range in the spring and summer. So it's a lot more dense. And uh, when we unroll this, I just sit here and hold the roll. My dad drives. And then we get it tightened up and then we walk back down and put in posts and we're done. So that's all we got to do. And then we'll be set up and ready to bring cows on here. You want me to pull ahead while you're good, Yep, you're good. Go ahead. So I just wanted to touch on the logistics of the uh, cover crop, what we've done, kind of answer a few things that don't regard uh, the farming side of it, or really the cow side. Uh, Dad and I put up electric fence. It took us about one, 1 1.75 miles to get everything in that we wanted. Needed an alleyway to a spring. Uh, about three three hours to do that, and that, that includes some, some running around and backtracking because we, we forgot a few things. So I think your labor requirement's pretty minimal. Uh, the fencing part is 100% on, on us as far as electric fence goes and then we split the border fence with Jones Farms 50-50. So that's, that's who takes care of the electric fence. Um, once that's up and we continue to move our alleys or, uh, or increase the paddock so to speak, you're looking at about a half hour a time just to go on, unhook the fence and and instead of rolling the wire up and moving it, since we're only moving it about 30 or 40 feet, we just, just continue to move that line further west down the field. So that's who takes care of all that. Uh, the labor is done by dad and I, we don't have to hire any, any extra labor done. Um, this is something we kind of plan to do once, once we got the hay up, we'd kind of develop a plan and then we, we got to it here. After the calves got preconditioned this fall, um, as far as the residual goes, we're gonna leave about half. We, 
we pay for half of the seed. Joneses pay for the other half. So we're not, we're not trying to totally graze it down so it looks like a kitchen table. Uh, but we are kind of playing with it and seeing, seeing how it looks if we move them every five days or every seven days. So that's, that's our first goal. Uh, our first move is going to be a, a seven day move. We'll, we'll see how much residual they leave. And if, if we go there in five days and we think it's time to move them, we will. If there's uh, enough material left after seven days, we'll leave them there longer. So that's, that's kind of our goal there. And then, um, they're about, they're about two miles away from the cover crop now. So on, on a morning when it's cool, we'll just trail them the whole way and we'll, we'll give them fr free grain and kind of let them, you know, the yearlings will kind of run around the perimeter and they'll, they'll find the water and they'll find the cover crop. But we find after a couple of days, they settle down and, and they're, they're, they're mostly on that, on that forage. So that's kind of how we go everything from a logistics standpoint. Um, not really a lot of labor into the electric fence, really. I don't think anyway, and and uh, it's it's pretty simple once everything's set up as far as moving it goes and and maintaining that boundary. So as you can see, I pursued a career in ranching because art did not work out, but I wanted to kind of show this this hard line around here is the border fence. This would be our pasture to the north of Joneses. And then to the south here, Joneses have the the cover crop, and then there's there's a diverse rotation with with lentils, different cereals, as as I explained before. But that's that's kind of how they rotate. So what we did, the squiggly line is the electric fence. So we just ran an alley about a half a mile, and then we went straight south. And then this line right here, going north and south, this is allowing about 15 acres of cover crop. So the yearlings can go back, they can drink from the spring, there is some grass there to eat, but 90% of that forage is the cover crop. So once once we're done with our first graze, which we're thinking five to seven days, we'll just take this line and we'll move it a little bit further west and a little bit further west, so on and so forth, until we get the entire thing grazed. So that's that's kind of how we set it up. Um, last year, there, there's a solar panel right in the middle of the pasture and we use that. So once once we get to the point where the cows are able to graze by the solar panel, we will, we will turn that on so they won't have to travel as far for water. So here's our newer setup. Just sits on a T-post like that. Uh, the ground is the same as before. I made it a little bit narrower. And then again, there's a half mile of wire there, but I just tested the voltage. And it comes in about 9.6, 9.5. So a little more voltage in before. Uh, I'd say part of that is shorter wire as well as maybe a newer battery or something. But pretty similar charge. We'll have cows on here tomorrow. All right, we just got the yearlings on here. 170. We don't know an exact acreage. I'd say they have about 15 acres. So here's looking back to the south. They got an alleyway there, probably about 25 yards wide, all the way to the border fence. And you can see the there's our corner on the electric fence in the stubble. Right there. And they have an alley all the way back to the east. Got about a hundred mile or a hundred yard wide alley to a spring coming around to another border fence here. So there's really not a lot, not a lot in the stubble formed eat. And uh, as you can tell, they appear to, to appreciate the crop. So we're hoping this will be a five to seven day move and uh, they'll have it trampled down. We'll have some contrast where the electric fence sat and where it didn't. And, hopefully get that crop terminated with cattle. So here's after two days. You can see I just moved the wire. Yearlings are slowly coming back from the water and moving themselves onto the new forage. I'll take the foraler and push them on there this first time just so they know what's there. But there's, uh, there's two days of grazing. 
A lot of straw left. I ate most of the heads off the oats. Uh, there's some patches of kochia that they've grazed down, so I think the farmer will be happy about that. Looking to the south, you're gonna have more cover crop left. We probably could have left them there for another day, but we're gonna be gone Wednesday and Thursday, so we wanted to plan ahead. So we've probably got four or five days of grazing here. So when we get back Thursday afternoon, we'll come over and take a peek at them. But when I came over with the four-wheeler, they pretty much just watched me. And as soon as they realized that the hot wire was down, they, they putted across. So it was pretty, pretty fun to see the cattle respond. And I think the hot wire in the alleys have been a success. So this is the fifth time we've moved them now. I think they've gotten used to the side by side. They followed us all the way down to here and they're right onto fresh feed.